Um, so <coughs> hello everyone. Um, <laughs> sorry I missed what sounded like a great introduction earlier. It's lovely to see you all here today. It's lovely to see so many enthusiastic faces and I'm really pleased um, that I can be a part of this. So what I'm going to do is spend a, a few minutes talking to you about a community engagement project um, which was facilitated, but I, only, I say only facilitated by the Department of Historical Studies at UJ because there were many people, including some people here, who've taken part in the project and it really has been a joint effort across the board. Uh, and hopefully, um, if anyone here is interested in doing um, community work, uh, you might find uh, something of interest to yourselves in what I'm going to say, some of the, the, the ways we carried on with the project. So these first slides, I think, is there anyone here who doesn't know where Sophia Town is? Stick up your hand. Sorry, I'm going to get a crick in my neck looking both ways. I was born in Okay. So a couple of you were born in Sophia Town? Yes. yes. Good. So most of you know where it is. There are a couple who don't, and for the people who don't, the aerial map is showing you Sophia Town, Johannesburg, and is this one of those things? Yes. Yes. Oh. I just need the point actually. Thanks. There we go. So, uh, where are we? I need to get my bearings now. Here is the University of Johannesburg, and here is Sophia Town, and Resolution Circle would be over here somewhere. So, um, over the last couple of years, um, the university, the, the <coughs> history department, has been uh, conducting this research with uh, residents of Sophia Town. Uh -huh. Um, this is just a slide to show you what um, Sophia Town looked like just after the forced removals in 1955. One of the only buildings still standing is Christ the King, which is over here and over here. And I don't think my pointer can reach as far as the last slide, uh, the last screen. Um, so the project began in 2010. Uh, Coming out of an oral history project on the Western areas conducted by the University of Johannesburg. And in the process of doing research, we, we had realized that people in Sophia Town, living currently in Sophia Town, were very interested in their own histories. Even if these histories weren't the same as the histories of Sophia Town. So that's just an important point to make. The aim of the project, <laughs> and any of you who have ever written a funding proposal will recognize funding speak here. So this is funding speak on the slide. The aim of the project is to develop ways of engaging the past that can assist in developing South Africans' capacity to participate in the country's continuing transition to a more democratic society. Uh, we wish to make individuals and their experiences in a fractured community because the fire town, in many ways, like other parts of South Africa, is a fractured community. Not just in terms of who lives there, but who feels that they, they have um, ownership of the memories of Sophia Town. Who's, who's in the memories of Sophia Town? Who do they belong to? Do they belong to everyone? Do they just belong to people who live in Sophia Town? These are deep questions, and they're all about democracy. Um, and we were also interested in thinking about if, if, if ordinary people, out of the context of a university, got to think about what history might mean for them, how could this add to the larger project in which we were engaged, which was really about building citizen activism? Um, just uh, uh, an old map, you can see here, Sophia Town, Western Native. That's telling you that this goes back quite a while to the time when West Dean was still known as Western Native Township. So it's over here, this is in the 1950s. And if anyone uh, 
if anyone lives in Sapphire Town today, have a look at all these streets that go right through. One of the things that the group areas did was to cut off these streets. So they're all these sort of, you know, turnarounds here, and very few of the streets from Sapphire Town go straight through onto on deckers, as you will all probably know. But that didn't used to be the case. So over the time, over over time. Uh, and I'm summarizing here, the work of the project um, came to be conducted through various um, divisions or subcommittees. Um, this is a, a, a current map, and in fact it's one of the outputs, if you like, of the project. Um, the map, uh, I was going to bring some along today, but the office in which the maps were was locked, but we produced um, community maps with essential listings. Uh, 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 police telephone numbers, uh, clinic telephone numbers, shop right checkers, other interested bodies, who to contact, how to get hold of the Sphire Town Residents Association. Um, uh, and this is uh, a map then that shows uh, Martindale. Remember where I was showing you those streets now? Short, uh, a few minutes ago, none of the streets go through. So the impact of group areas and the forced removals has left a physical imprint on the landscape, which cuts off Westbury from Sophia Town in many different ways. How many people here are from Westbury? Quite a few. Okay, so you know what I'm talking about as well. The histories of Sophia Town and Westbury are very closely linked. So in our project, we work very um, loosely with the term Sophia Town resident. So as not to be exclusive, we included in the description anyone who lived and worked in the suburb, so even if they didn't sleep in the suburb at night, and anyone who considered themselves a resident of Sophia Town, or, or, or considered that they had some claim on the space that we know today as Sophia Town. So we worked with quite an amorphous group of people. Um, and I would say that starting off in about 2009, in fact, we've come into contact with large numbers of the people who live in Sophia Town. Um, and many of them have uh, gone on to be stalwarts <coughs> in our project. Um, so much so that uh, their names uh, appear <coughs> on the front. I'll show this to you later of all. On the second page of the book, this is a book we produced from our research called Experiencing Sophia Town. Uh, and the project team listed here um, includes a number of people who live in Sophia Town today. So we were very concerned as academics not to replicate the typical distance that exists between academics, you know, stuck in their ivory towers, you know, and regular folk, because let's face it, academics usually aren't regular folk. Um, so that was quite an important part of our project. Okay, so we also had, uh, this is a, uh, just another uh, shot of, of Sophia Town, looking at Westbury over here. Um, and these are, this is a little industrial strip that separates the two. Uh, we also had participants from neighbouring suburbs like uh, Westbury uh, who, who have taken part uh, in the project. And it's interesting to see how many of the people who took part in our projects, the residents of Sophia Town, had grown up in Sophia Town, whose parents had been moved to Westbury after the removals and had moved back to Sophia Town after 1994. So uh, the whole area is well used and well understood by the people who live in the broader area. Um, and it was apartheid spatial planning that draw the, drew these rigid boundaries. What you see on the screen here is a, um, the wall looks a bit different. This is an older slide. But the house that is now the Sophia Town Cultural and Heritage Center, which was the house of one of Sophia Town's most distinguished uh, former residents, a former president of the ANC, Alfred Bettini Kuma, who was also one of the first African doctors to be trained in South Africa. He trained in the United States and in Glasgow in the 1920s and 1930s. 
And he had to move out of Sophia Town in the 1950s. So the project was co-directed by residents and researchers. Uh, as I said, it was not about UJ researchers going into the community, extracting, milking the community like a cow, and thinking, here yeah, we've got our product, let's go. In fact, in some ways, I think that, um, well, there are people in Sophia Town who are very good friends of mine, who are very dear friends of mine these days, because of the relationship that we've built. This is a slide from one of our activities. One of our early project in activities involved um, giving project participants disposable cameras. Um, and even five years ago, cell phone cameras weren't as ubiquitous as you might think. They weren't as everywhere as you might think. And printing photos from these and then discussing them in groups to see what the discussion of photographs together would reveal to people about their history. So not just a one-on-one -on -one interview. You know, if I were to come and interview you, it sets up a particular dynamic. But if I come to your table and everyone has photographs and we all interact with each other, it's a different kind of methodology. It allows for much more interaction and group sharing. It's a more group-driven uh, process, perhaps like focus groups. Uh, and in some ways, some of the work we did was almost focus group based. Um, and some of, the, some of you will be familiar with that. Okay, so here we have um, uh, one of my favorite pictures uh, from the project, um, a photograph by a resident called Earl Bond, who took a picture of some children swinging on the slides in the Good Street Park. Um, and his comment is on the next page. So we sent people out to take pictures of things they felt were important to them. We didn't go and say, take pictures of important places. We said, let yourself be the conduit and take pictures of what you think is important. So in my Photo Voice project, I wanted to tell the story about the history of Sophia Town. I call this picture Kids on the Swing. Now, you see, in the simple act of interacting with a photograph, you get the dialogue that says, I took this picture to highlight that this playground was once a whites-only playground. Today, this park is multiracial. It's a place where kids of all races come to play. And we produced out of this project a series of postcards um, uh, from different residents which had text on the back, which you can read on the screen. And it's about how people felt that they were relating to the current space that is Sophia Town. So not the historic space of Sophia Town, not what happened in the 1950s, the forced removals, which is the sad side, but the more um, vibrant community that was Sophia Town before the removals. That was part of our project, but we were more interested in how people today were living with Sophia Town and experiencing Sophia Town. One of our activities <laughs> uh, was to set up a cooking club in the community. Where are you? There you are, stand up. There she is in the photograph. Um, where uh, a, a bunch of women got together uh, once a month, sometimes more often. Um, are you still doing it? Yes. Uh, to share recipes. Uh, and this photograph is from when we um, uh, held a sort of information day at the local ShopRite Checkers to talk about the project work. Uh, and some of the photos that you can see here come from a cookbook. Uh, that was produced, and I have a slide to show you at the end of the presentation. So we were keen on the kinds of outputs that would actually relate to people living in Sophia Town, thanks Naomi, um, rather than just people who were somewhere out there. Um, and here we go, um, some of the cook sisters who also participated in the cooking club. 
Um, and I'll show you a slide, as I said, at the front of the, cooking, the, the, the cookery book later on. Okay, one of the big projects, uh, and it's the, the, the book that I'm showing over here, was putting together, uh, getting residents to put together their own history of the subject, uh, their own history of the suburb. It involved um, uh, other projects, also involved working with youth. Uh, there are a number of, of um, young people uh, who consider Sophia Town their home, who've worked with us. And I'm still, even, even if I don't see them as often as I would like, I'm still Facebook friends with them. And I'm going to make a point about social media at the end of this presentation. Uh, we had fun runs, we've had movie nights in the park, and various other fairly low-key, low-resource-based um, interventions in Sophia Town. Low resource in the sense that you don't need something that's going to consume a lot of money because that's not sustainable in the long term. If you want a project that's sustainable, that leaves something behind, it has to be something that people can sustain with their own efforts, not with you know donors coming in, dropping money, and then once the money's gone, the project is gone. Um, <laughs> I have a, a, a very um, a vivid memory of a freezing day in 2012 when we organized a fun run through the suburb and uh, I've just put up a slide of some of my colleagues, you can see how cold they were, uh, <laughs> participating in the fun run. Um, and there are uh, lots of extra people walking through the streets. The idea behind the fun run or the fun walk was to take back the streets of Sophia Town for Sophia Town residents to feel safe in their own streets. Um, now, I think I'm going to skip that, those slides, because they are uh, heavy text slides. Um, what I'm showing you here is some of the work of the youth. Um, uh, just participating in a project, we ran a number of um, youth-based focus groups uh, that were designed to get um, uh, young people in Sophia Town thinking about what was important about the history of their own subject. Um, and uh, there are people here who will know that um, one of the key players in this project was someone called Katharina Fink, a German PhD student, who since has taken several of these people uh, overseas to Germany to visit uh, her institution. So I thought I would um, share you some of the text um, that in fact a uh, similar text has appeared in our book, um, uh, the book that emerged from this project. But it's about how people use the discussions around history to grapple with difficult issues. So in one of the family interviews, um, one of our project members, Dave, raised a question about the prior history of Sophia Town. And you can see that this is a, a, a response from one of the project participants. Um, uh, and this exchange was interesting. Uh, what it shows is that for many people living in Sophia Town today, they're not the former residents of Sophia Town. Many of them have learned about the history of Sophia Town through books or movies or going to clubs. Come on, who hasn't been to something like a Sophia Town club or seen a Sophia Town movie or um, the Sophia Town lounge, there's Sophia Town fabric. Sophia Town is everywhere. And for many people, this is how they've learned what was the history of Sophia Town. Even the people who live in Sophia Town at the moment. Um, and these are deep issues because they speak to issues about, you know, who's responsible for the past, where do we apportion blame for the past, and how do we try to move forward? Um, this is a slide from one of our focus groups. Um, you can see that uh, uh, we had a whiteboard up there, photographs that we took. People are busy discussing not only the history of Sophia Town, but how to proceed with all the material that we were collecting. So it's one thing to go out there and collect all this material, 
as I said earlier, but it's another thing what you do with it. How do you make something from a project that feeds back into community engagement itself? Thank you. Okay. <coughs> One of the things that struck us about working in Sophia Town was the way in which people talked about children in the future and how their interest in the past was always mediated by or affected by what kind of futures they wanted their children to have. So certainly one of the lessons that we've learned from this project is if you want to get people to talk about history, ask them about their kids and what their kids are going to do in future because it gets people to start thinking across long time periods. Uh, let's see. Ooh. Some of my slides got lost. Um, I wanted to show you if you... Um, I'm gonna, some of my slides disappeared for some other reason. I'm about to finish up. I just wanted to talk about what the project actually achieved in terms of concrete outcomes, because there was a lot of discussion. So one of the things is this book, which is really a series of conversations with residents that was worked upon by a number of the project participants, although it was collated by two of the project members at UJ. Since this book was published by Jakana last year, it's gone on to be taken up by a publishing house in the United States of America so it's now available in America, published by the University of Indiana Press. That's great. Awesome. This is where it's luckily that I have some physical props. We have a very nice Facebook site, both for the book and for the group. And these things have continued to run once uh, it's not really an active project anymore. Um, we don't have weekly meetings in the, the uh, community. Um, some people still attend meetings of the Sophia Town Residents Association. Um, but the university has pretty much stepped back. You know, we've got other lives, we've moved on with other things. There are a whole bunch of students in my department who've done histories of different aspects of Sophia Town, like the St. Joseph Children's Home. Anyone go there? Okay, so there's a very nice history. So the production around this is ongoing, and we also have a nice special issue of an academic journal. So those of you who are wondering what happens to this kind of work, is it academic as well? Um, which is, uh, has some very nice pictures in it. In fact, the, most, the thing I'm most proud about is the way in which we got an academic journal to do us. You can hardly see, I had some of this in my slideshow full colour pictures, which for any of you who work with academic journals know to get full colour is actually very difficult. We've got two Facebook sites. The Facebook sites are up and running. And there's regular, um, I think that there, 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 there is a sense of pride, that's my impression, as an outsider insider, that there's a sense of pride in what the project has achieved. Um, and there are a number of people, as I said earlier here today, who've been involved in the project. And I'm eternally grateful to you, most of, of whom are ladies, for all the work that you've put in to help some rather bumbling academics from UJ try to take their ideas about community engagement into a welcoming community space and to see that, in fact, where it's at is not in the university, but out there with ordinary people like yourselves. Thank you very much. <laughs>